Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this quick lunchtime speed show. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Vanessa. I'm a writer, curator and educator uh, based in London. And I co-founded the contemporary platform That's Eagle Art in 2017 with my partner, Martin. So since then, we have been uh, visiting uh, the studios of emerging artists. We have this goal of visiting one artist per week uh, to nurture you know, in-depth uh, behind the scenes conversations. And uh, our activities have, have expanded to include um, exhibitions, commissions, educational initiatives, um, and um, yeah, uh, I'm really excited to have collaborated with, um, you know, the cultivator uh, to showcase the synesthesia uh, project. Um, so we've been working with some artists within our platform, sorry, writers within our platform, as well as external writers uh, who have been commissioned to write texts in response to 10 artists from Cornwall uh, and the Art Isles of Sicily. So it's it was really interesting to like um, facilitate this exchange between, the, you know, like, city voices as well as like the rural community and you know people that don't get the chance to like interweave uh, as much uh, as as you know uh, as possible um so here we've got um a mix of artists and writers who have been part of the synesthesia project uh, who are going to present um first up we have uh, kate walters who is an artist who's been making drawings paintings and passages of text about love being in love and desire for the past two years. She's undergone psychoanalysis and reflected on myths such as Inanna, Dumuzi, Eros, Psyche, etc. So in this, in this session, she will cover three recent texts about these three paintings, which have been exciting, reassuring, and fruitful. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kate. Hi, thank you, Vanessa. And thank you very much for coming to my recent exhibition. Um, I'm going to immediately diverge slightly from what I said I was going to do. I hope that's okay, because I've been reading the essays, which um, I've got here, and they are available online. They're in the press section of Arusha Gallery, apart from Laurie's, which I've sent to um, Gary, and he will be sending that around. Because I, when I read the essays, and I thought what, you know, which bits I could extract, um, it was just too difficult because each essay is, uh, you know, really full and there's such a lot in them. And if, if I just taken a little bit, it, it would have been, um, it wouldn't have made much sense. So I just wanted to say how supportive they were, because I think that's really important. And they helped me to see my work in a slightly different way. I'm going to read a few little bits from Laurie's text, which was part of the Synesthesia Project. And he began his essay, and I've just extracted a few bits, by saying, by quoting something I've written. Because I, I should say also that I find writing writing, painting and drawing are absolutely and utterly interwoven for me and each one extends the other and each one helps me to take my practice further. So I'm just in the dream I leave your house, you follow me, we talk and laugh as we used to. You place your hands around the back of my head, your fingers massaging my well of dreams, my hair springs up between your fingers. This is one of the first bits of writing I did which I then worked, a, made a painting from. And I never used to um, connect my dreams and my paintings, but when I started psychoanalysis, I began to do that. Sorry, I'm speaking very fast because I've got an absolute mountain of stuff to, cut, to cover. Um, and then Laurie talked about how in a time of social media enforced censorship and a broader culture where sexuality is a far removed topic from education and everyday life, Walters is keen to bring thoughts surrounding this bodily topic and the freedoms it can unlock into the conversation of contemporary art. So my work, as Vanessa has already said, is all about eros and desire and longing. And my work's been shadow banned on Instagram. Um, and I didn't know this, but Laurie, Laurie discovered this when he was doing the research for writing his essay. Um, so it means that people can't find my work because I'm dealing with things that people find challenging. It's hidden. So that's that's. Laurie's essay is available and I've sent the link to Gary so he's disseminated that so I'm just going to say this is my show that's on at the moment at Arusha Gallery in Edinburgh and I'm now going to and here are the two essays there's an essay by Joseph Seward who's a psychoanalysis psychoanalyst and by Amy Hale who writes about fairy tales and other worlds um, they're both available on the Arusha Gallery website in the press section but I'm going to do something that feels a bit more I'm, I am digressing, I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to do something that feels a bit more kind of alive for me, 
I mean, they're terrifically alive, but this is absolutely current. And as an artist, I don't know if other artists feel this, but I'm really excited by things that are completely current. So I've just come back after my show in Edinburgh. I went to Iona, which is a place I often go to, and I did these little tiny weeny drawings. And you can see there's not much to them, really. I just sat on the beach with my watercolours and I did these drawings. And they're part of a, a sequence where I'll just show you a couple more, which I did in the back of my car when I was camping. So there's these, there's these little drawings that I do on this lovely Japanese paper. And they're exploring the same things that are in my paintings, which are about eros, they're about the body, they're about desire. And these drawings, I have them beside me and I use them as prompts for my writing. And then it's that writing that then goes to other writers who then write about my work. And it's a kind of, it's a cyclical thing. So the writing that came from these drawings I've just shown you, the beach at the North End, Iona, everything is a love letter. I sit on the beach, I draw a boy. His head looks both ways. He looks as if he's sowing seeds for the tide to lick and carry until a great whale's back lifts the waters high. She'll make an island for his flesh. The seeds will stick. There'll be a new race of plants in a different age. They'll breathe water and air. They'll know fire and they'll freeze. The boy walks on sowing seeds. I draw her as she's birthing the baby hanging upside down. He's looking behind her with his newborn eyes as he swings from her lips. They're still holding on to his legs and his tiny penis and vision pours from her face. It's a river in flood, the crown of a tree in autumn and a dust cloud and pigment from an Italian mountain washing over the paper. As I sit in the sun, it softens her breasts and above her crown is created by your thoughts settling on me when I think of you. I'm writing from a drawing I might have made in your hut with ink made from walnut skins. We were together in the dream and your hut was on stilts way up there swaying in the trees. And in the drawing, I'm on the floor, I'm curled, my skirt gathered over my legs and there's an opening and I'm falling forwards. I'm a horse, my arms curled around my long head. And in another drawing, you are sitting the way you do with your hands by your sides. And I can hardly believe I'm going to see you today. You with all your hidden knowledge and mine, all those secrets and desires. And in the drawing, you're looking down with your hair wrapped around your head like a turban, wise man, healer. And I'm growing out from somewhere in your body. I'm inhabiting a place of solace between your legs. I'm growing out for you, from you and I'm bending forwards with my arms around my head. So this is the, so what I, I make these, this writing, I have used my iPad and I have my drawings beside me and they can be drawings that I've made at home or drawings that I've made on Iona. And they're, but they're not separate from what happens in my studio in my painting. I just look at them and they kind of, they just trigger the words that then just kind of, they just flow just like a drawing comes. Um, and I just wanted to also emphasize the role of dreaming because when in, in the dreams, I receive certain images and those images then kind of um, are platted into the writing and they also come into the painting, help me understand the painting. I, is my time up? No. no. No, you're doing well, you're doing well. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, so shall I show a few more drawings? I don't know what I was going to mention actually. My first book, because everyone was talking about books earlier. So I, I thought I'd mention my first book, which is called I Own a Notebook. So I've got a few copies left. This was published by Guillemot Press, who I noticed someone mentioned earlier as well. Um, and this was my first, uh, yeah, my first time of, of having a book published. And it's all sorts of drawings that I made on Iona um, in a similar way to the, how I've just described really. Um, although I was using, I'm using different materials here. And my writing is my first time I'd been published and um, yeah, and again, it was very bodily. I mean, it was probably quite horrifying to some of the people who were in the community and went to I Iona Abbey, because I've written here, I gathered the water to touch that part of myself, to put my lips against sea lips. And that was about walking naked into the sea and experiencing, um, you know, the water touching me. Uh, so yeah, and also bringing in the visual, just going back to the publishing aspect, my publisher made these postcards to go with the book, which were done, made from drawings that I did whilst I was um, in the 
Hebrides. So that was another thing to kind of extend the book. Um, so I think I'll just show a few more drawings if that's okay. Or should I read from one of the essays? Um, however you you is better. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will read a bit. Well, I've been do I've done a lot of reading. Would you like to see pictures or hear words? I guess um, maybe a couple of words, <laughs> and then we can. Right. I'm going to read from Joseph Suet's essay. Sometimes, when you wake in the morning, the dream you are in is still clung around your thoughts, so you know you haven't quite left it. Mostly, you can feel it. And if you try to remember it or remember more than the very last bit of it, you can follow it back just about. Bits will be fading. The feeling will be getting gently bleached. But the words you use to tell yourself the narrative of the dream don't quite fit. And as you become more awake, the richness of the dreamscape, dreamscape recedes from rich oils through pastel colours and watercolour impressions to a blank canvas. It is as if the waters have covered it over and it was never there. The dream seems to have gone and left you with only intimations which nevertheless linger on through the day. It's as if we had met someone on a train at random and had an unexpectedly intimate conversation during which we had the conviction that we really understood each other, really, if only for a moment, knew each other. As if during that conversation we had relaxed and the envelope of our being had loosened and stretched and we had found ourselves expanding towards them. And when we walked home from the station, having arrived at our destination and waved goodbye, we realized we didn't know their name. And as the days pass, we become less and less sure that the conversation as we recall the feeling of it really took place. We can hardly imagine it. And the sense we had of ourselves as we stretched and expanded towards them no longer seems real. And so the reality of who we were or are in the dream or with that person on the train also fades and we gradually dismiss it. Even if we remember bits of the conversation or bits of the dream, we let it fall away. There is nothing to show for it. Kate Walters does the opposite to this with her love paintings. And when we stand in front of them, it is as if we are drawn back into the dreamscape or back into the chance encounter with someone who got us right under our skin. She gives form to the dream world so it gets into the light of day and doesn't get fractured by language. In ancient, ancient Greece, anyone who could speak Greek could participate in the Eleusian mysteries. It was open to all. And yet none who did could speak of their experience. It was as if it could not be spoken of, as if it was beyond words and words would bleach it. Going into, the, into a room with these love paintings, is like being a participant who has returned to that Eleusian mystery. The paintings are not representations of what happened. They do not speak of it, but the pictorial forms, the pigments intensity, texture and movement call you back to the experience. If you can let go your grip on material reality and as it were, close your eyes, you can open yourself again to your dream experience. And we all dream, we just don't all remember. You want me to carry on is that thank you so much Kate that's really really truly amazing I love how tactile your the words are and I love how you were asking whether to focus on text or on visuals because I guess that's the core of like the synesthesia showcase is the actual mix between text and images and not really giving priority to one over the other but interweaving those mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm sure we can um, uh, allow the audiences to ask any questions about anything that you've read or shown us. I welcome everyone to put things in the chat if they if they would want to and we can go back to that uh, later on. Uh, I'm going to pass on um, to Brooke Wilson, who is um, a writer and curator. She's interested in the mat materiality of language, which I guess is very linked with what you've just been presenting, Kate, and uh, how it can be explored creatively to make it more accessible. Brooke works closely with artists and has strengthened her desire to explore the dialogue between art and words and the role language plays in how we perceive art. And I know Brooke is at the moment uh, overseas in New York, so I really appreciate the early morning wake up. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to hear what you, what you have to say. 
Thank you, Vanessa. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's not too bad. It's 7.15. So but if I look a little um, romantically lit, it's because it's still quite dark. <laughs> um, but I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so can everybody see my screen? OK, cool. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd start um, thank you. The introduction was perfect and kind of what I'm hoping to discuss in my in my little slot now. Um, but I thought that I would start with sort of a bit about me and how I guess I got into writing. Um, so my background is a fine art background and I went to Central St. Martins um, to study fine art. Um, and on that course, I guess I explored a lot without realizing about language and the page and the page being a space um, for words um, and using language as more of a material than as kind of just a form of communication. Um, so this was a painting that I did that was based on an A4 page uh, and it was basically blown up size of an A4 page with A4 pages placed down on the canvas. And this is in like a progress, but um, I just thought it was quite a good place to start in terms of how I then approached working with the two artists that I collaborated with for the synesthesia project um, and kind of positioning myself as a writer, but also as kind of a creative in using language in sort of a different way. Or, you know, I'm still figuring that out, but um, that's sort of the premise of, of my interests. Um, and then I thought sort of as the best way of um, explaining or exploring my ideas would be to use the synesthesia text that I wrote um, for this project. So this is Nathan Henton's um, essay. Um, and Nathan's an amazing sculptor working with um, wood. And so a lot of his work is about sort of materiality of the wood and how in, the, in his kind of practice, he uses, he works alongside the wood. So it, the wood kind of has its own properties that he then has to explore. So in that sort of sense and on that line, when I spoke with Nathan, I wanted to kind of explore this idea of somehow emulating the work within the text. And as an exercise, we, well, he wrote a manifesto where he basically listed um his kind of different rules that he sets himself when he makes and the different things that are going through his head and from this kind of long I think it was like three pages long from this text I then decided I quite liked the idea that we had like notes and broke his work into four separate kind of genres I guess that was what I was going to write about one of which was the wood and then I'll show you the rest. But so in sort of playing with the words and the materiality of words, I decided to kind of format the lists in an almost, I like kind of echoed the different marks and shapes and forms of his sculptures. So you can see it more here where the words are kind of jutting out either side. Um, and there were four columns of this that went throughout the essay. Um, so yeah, like kind of, I was saying before, I think that an element of, and whenever I start to write, I like to think about if there's an element of playfulness or an element that can be visual and also informative that can be interwoven within um, the text. And I think that it kind of breaks it up, but it also alludes to kind of a wider concept of where the writing starts and hopefully sets a kind of the scene for where it's gonna be going. Um, so that's kind of one example of where I've utilized this. And then another one that I thought would be kind of more like an exercise is, and this is from my uh, text for Hugh, who I know I think is on still on this call. Um, and Hugh's work, again, was a really interesting one for me because it is very visual and there was a lot of different layers to it that we sort of unpacked in our conversations. And in sort of going back to Vanessa's introduction and what I wanted to kind of talk about in this in this session is the idea that using language in a more creative way and how 
that can potentially be more accessible to a wider audience. And when I mean accessible, and um, you know, like these words kind of are used within a lot within our kind of daily dialogue, or especially within the arts. But I think that in terms of what I mean, this is maybe a good example. So I, I thought what I would do is read this aloud. And I know maybe some of you know Hugh's work, but maybe some of you don't. And so I kind of like you to have like a mental or visual image of the work as I read this bit of text. And after I'll show you the work and whether it's similar or dissimilar, it doesn't really matter. I think that the key is that it's unlocked a kind of visual side of the brain before I then show you the image that we're discussing. Um, so yeah, I'll read this now. So roundabouts, parks, car parks, letting agents, roofs and former churches all contribute to the final form of his sculptures. As well as the geographical elements, there is also a considered technological aesthetic that takes direct configurations from the geometries of the vandalized towers. Reminiscent of astronomical comets or shooting stars, three-dimensional forms are depicted in a two-dimensional mass, disappearing when observed from the side and capturing a transient moment of stillness, slicing through space. So, I guess in this way, and like when I kind of set my style that I'm sort of developing with language is that it's quite descriptive um, and that I want to kind of offer a different lens to the work itself rather than just explaining the work. I hope that it adds or gives the work something more, um, which I think is a very interesting collaboration between text and and like visual images or you know artworks because a text I think should offer more than just a description it should offer like a different reading or an idea that you know could be explored further vis um, linguistically than visually um, so now kind of going off what we've I've just read I wanted to then show you Hugh's work which is below and you know maybe we can discuss this like in the Q&A if the language or the text itself gave a different reading or if in your mind you're imagining something very different to what you've seen and I guess that's up for debate whether the text should be like a direct um it should like offer a direct understanding of the work or whether the your own kind of imagination should be able to run free before seeing the work um, and then it brings something new to it so yeah I guess that's that's kind of everything that I wanted to to touch on in my in my time which I hope I've made good time thank you very much Brooke and I love how you've opened up these questions which we can return to um in the Q&A section uh, it's definitely something uh, that everyone can relate to, uh, whether it's, um, you know, you, you as a writer can have your own identity and voice and put that into the, into the text or how much you're compromising the work of the artist or, you know, and making it your own work instead of actually, you know, being, um, um, thinking about what the artist really, you know, is trying to, to explore in the work. Uh, so yeah, this is really amazing. I guess the good thing about the synesthesia showcase is that the constant dialogue between the writers and the artists and the sharing of the process and hoping that within that exchange, uh, you can actually, you know, uh, share your ideas in, in process and the artists can, you know, also reflect and respond to that in the same time. Um, and yeah, moving forward, we're going to go with Moraya Ogumbiji, who's also was part of the showcase as a writer. And he's uh, also an analog photographer with a background in post-colonial history. Uh, Moraya is going to explore how writing can allow authors to express their unique lived experiences using a key text from his MA dissertation as a brief case study. Um, thanks, Vanessa. Um, hello, I hope you're all having a good um, good day so far. I'm just going to share my share my screen. Um, can everyone see? Yes. Um, 
as Vanessa just mentioned, I'm I'm Mariah Roganby, a writer and photographer with a background in post-colonial history, currently based in London. Um, I'm going to talk about how written communication has the power to enable writers to convey their experiences using a uh, text that I focused on during my MA dissertation last year. Um, so what is writing? Um, what is writing? Writing is an ancient practice. People have been writing for thousands of years. Previously thought to have originated in ancient Sumer in modern day Iraq about 5,000 years ago, before being adopted by neighboring city states in a process described as cultural diffusion. It's now widely accepted that writing emerged multiple times independently in unique locations. Um, such as and not limited to um, Shang Dynasty China. Um, here's an inscribed um, scapula. Um, this is an example of Oracle Bone Script. Um, Mesoamerica, here's um, an example of um, an early like Zapotec script um, from the site of Monte Alban in, um, in Central America. And um, West Africa as the MCBD script. Um, this is actually a, a recent example, but um, this script has been in use for um, over a thousand years. Writing has the ability to preserve intricate meanings over long periods of time. Writing systems evolve slowly in comparison to spoken communication. Dated language features remain in language for centuries after they fall out of use in day-to-day -day speech. The written word can be a time capsule of the emotions and ideas of individuals, groups, and cultures. Words can, more than often, outlive the writer. Um, Ewan Clayton, a calligrapher and design professor at the University of Sutherland argues that, and I quote, people developed writing to communicate across space and time carrying it with them as they traded, migrated and conquered. From its first uses for counting and naming things and communicating beyond the grave, humans have altered and enriched writing to reflect their complicated needs and desires. Why should we write? Writing is a expression of the complex experiences and ideas of individuals often from different cultures, ethnicities, and environments. Written narratives can empower authors. Individual texts are expressions that can inspire and inform readers, while also chronicling unique periods and all moments in time. Last year, during my History of Arts Master's degree at SOAS University of London, I centered my dissertation on the relationships of power present in Nigerian artist, Bruce Onabrak Payer's 1969 series, The Stations of the Cross. Um, on the screen now uh, are two, um, two sections of um, the series, which um, was actually, con it consisted of, uh, it consists of 14, uh, 14 individual prints. This is um, the 10th the 10th print, which is Jesus, Jesus' clothes are torn off, and the 12th print underneath it, Jesus dies on the cross. Um, so this series was created nine years after Nigeria's independence from the British Empire. Um, Bruce on a Black Pairs series depicts the biblical 14 stations of the cross, which refers to the, uh, the journey that Jesus took from his condemnation by Pontius Pilate um, in Herod's palace, along the Via Dolorosa in um, Jerusalem to his eventual crucifixion at Golgotha. Honor Brack Payer situates his narrative um, in colonial Nigeria, depicting the Romans as British colonial officers and the people of Jerusalem 
including Jesus and Pontius Pilate as indigenous Nigerians. Through my thesis, I sought to argue that the artist, Bruce Onabrakea, had provided a unique commentary on his contemporary society in colonial Nigeria through his depictions of the um, individual figures and um, artistic references um, in the series. For my analysis, I focused on multiple texts. I turned to authors that I felt um, explored the impacts and effects of colonialism well. Um, these authors had lived in and been directly impacted by colonial systems. As primary sources, these texts were reflections of the complicated needs and desires of the individual authors. For this presentation, I will now talk about one of the key texts that I used in my analysis. Black Skin, White Masks was written in 1952 by Franco Martinique, a um, psychiatrist and political philosopher, Franz Fanon. Um, during the Second World War, um, France, uh, Franz Fanon experienced colonial racism, the ideology that European colon col um, colonists were inherently superior to indigenous peoples. Um, Fanon was subjected to this by both the French resistance which he joined in um, 1943 at the age of 18, and the Nazi allied um, Vichy France. In Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon responds to his environment through his writing. Fanon presents first-hand experiences while critiquing the psychological effects um, that um, racism and dehumanization um, that he experienced um, both in Martinique and in Europe while he was um, fighting in the Second World War. Um, uh, he um, explains, he talks about these effects and he argues that these effects are inherent in um, colonial environments. Fanon constructs his theories by evaluating his lived experiences and the interpersonal human relationships that he observed and experienced during his, um, during his life. Um, writing allowed Fanon to express and share his emotions and ideas with a wider audience. Although passing away in 1961 at the age of 36, Fanon's provocative texts outlive him, working to convey snapshots of his world to readers in the present day. Um, why is writing important? I think I, I'm interested in writing and currently use it as my primary medium because it allows me to communicate my emotions and ideas um, clearly. Writing allows me to reflect on my own experiences. Um, I'm able to evaluate the ways that I perceive my environment as I develop my texts. Authors can gain control over narratives through writing. They can give their perspective on issues or events that they're influenced by, interested in, or particularly affect them. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Mariah, for sharing this. And I'm curious to see whether, if we have time later, you might be able to share some extracts from this text that you wrote, <laughs> if we have any time uh, left later on. Um, and maybe even um, some of your photographs as well and how they do relate to your writing, if, if there's any chance. Um, and moving forward, I'm going to introduce to Na Naomi Freyers, who is an artist who, whose practice includes work with film and video, printmaking, painting, and collaborative curatorial projects. She will talk about collaborating with art writers, nonfiction writers, your journalist and two poets, experiences that have been both enjoyable and challenging. Uh, and always less grueling than trying to write her own words, something that is slowly creeping into her work. Um, and I'm aware that Naomi was part of the first edition of Synesthesia as well. Yeah. Hello there. Um, yeah, so I've been finding it really interesting listening to everybody's ways of thinking and talking about writing. And I'm just going to talk about this small part of it. Uh, let me share my screen.
Have you got it? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So I'm just going to read. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm going to talk about my slightly hesitant relationship with writing over the last eight years while showing you parts of my first ever film, still here, very different from what I make now, uh, without the sound. Uh, it was with this film that I first worked collaboratively with writers, even though I didn't know what that looked like until it was actually happening. All I knew was at the time I wanted other voices to be involved. I contacted two writers I admired and a neuroscientist early on in the making of the film and invited them to be part of the show. They said yes, which was a big surprise, and I asked them to respond to the images I was gathering in very different ways. This film would be a solo show at New Newland Art Gallery, a really big deal for me, and the curator suggested that I add a fourth writer, the poet Ella Frears, who's my daughter, then a recent graduate from Goldsmiths. So for this film, the neuroscientist Kalina Christoph, a professor at the University of British Columbia, wrote about undirected thought. Uh, the award-winning non-fiction writer Simon Garfield wrote beautifully about time and duration. And the journalist and author Jeremy Harding used rhythm and collage in a wonderfully experimental way to respond to the images I was sending to him. And Ella Frears explored the link between her voice and my images as a parallel for our relationship. She was free to write about anything, of course, even when what she wrote was very close to the bone. And her writing really had an impact on the audience. So much so that I was encouraged to make a shorter film just accompanied by Ella's writing, which then won an award at the Exeter Contemporary Open. We've worked together twice since then. I made a film around her poems about a long distance relationship and motorway service stations between Cornwall and London. And she wrote about two films I made last year weaving them together across the two institutions I was showing in. I want to say something about the more usual connection between a writer and an artist, when one writes about the other. This is a distinctive relationship because a particular kind of conversation takes place. The writer needs to find things out about what the artist is thinking and doing. They have their own instincts, but they don't want to make assumptions. So they ask questions that unlock meaning in the work. As an artist, I'm probably not alone in feeling inarticulate about my own work. I don't seem to be able to frame it intelligently. I know what matters to me, but I never know how to express it in words. Alice Spalls, an editor at the London Review of Books and one of the three founders of independent feminist publisher, The Silver Press, wrote about my paintings for a show in London in 2019. It was like being unpeeled, but in a lovely way. And it was great to have someone so thoughtful thinking hard about my work. Uh, this essay is on my website, which is under construction at the moment, but anyway, it's easy to find if you want to see it. So I feel I should talk about how writing crept into my work. Uh, some of you in this, in this uh, meeting uh, already write, which is brilliant, but I have always avoided it and found it and still find it challenging. I don't know what I want, only that I don't know how to start, or how to work through the difficulties that language, language seems to amplify rather than resolve. My first attempt to bring writing into my work was for a film I was asked to make for a touring show, Many and Beautiful Things in 2018, about the splendor and the awfulness of growing up. I wrote eight true, very short stories about vanity, minor crime and embarrassment. This was very difficult for me as it involved writing and rewriting many times until I felt the right kind of distance from my teenage self. I wrote in the present tense, so it didn't sound like a memory, but something that could be happening now. It then felt almost normal when I received the Exeter Phoenix Moving Image Commission to write again. This time, two years later, I wanted to try and write about my dad's death. There were funny moments in the days leading up to his death, and I wanted to write about those. Not at all easy and I'm not sure why I thought I could do that. Um, it took me a very long time to cook it all down to the plainest language possible. Uh, I want to briefly talk about the other poet I've worked with. That poet is John Wedgwood Clark, and he wrote about a polluted river in Cornwall, the Red River, 
and I used his writings as the lens through which I looked at the river when I made a film. It was a really interesting constraint to have someone else's writing as the entire reason for the film. And he was very generous in letting me choose which parts of his work I used, usually in a text appearing in the film or by his reading a small part of the work. Finally, I want to talk about working with Tom Jeffries, a respected writer based in Scotland, who's contributed to many art publications, including Freeze and Art Review. And he was my blind date when Synesthesia put us together in 2020. We had several online conversations which were quiet and focused with Tom drilling down into my practice with film and video. His area of specialism is frequently nature in contemporary art, and this is not the subject of my films. So I was concerned he wouldn't connect with my work. I loved what he wrote so much that I made a publication around it for my solo show last year, Men Falling. My favorite bit of what he wrote is this. I feel like I'm sitting on a train, allowing thoughts to wander as the world blurs by outside. But where is Freya's taking us? Her language is straightforward, clear, present tense, few rhetorical flourishes, but so much is left unsaid. If a narrative is a way to make sense of the world, do Frears's films make sense? I mean, why would they? Like her paintings, there is something enigmatic about speaking so very clearly. Thank you very much. That was really a, a great ending. <laughs> And um, yeah, I really love how you've de uh, uh, devolved, evolved and developed your conversation with something that started as a, you know, in the Synesthesia project and has evolved into a continuous collaboration. And I'm wondering whether that will happen in this edition as well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I welcome everyone that wants to, to add any questions on the chat, if you'd like. I'm also curious if you have questions between each other for the speakers um, to other speakers that have chatted today. And if not, then maybe or or you know we can go back to some of the questions that were already posed by some of the speakers, like Brooke. Um, I know that you were interested in knowing whether people, um, you know, thought that the visual matched with the text that you had written. And I'm also curious to know what what you know what your opinion is uh, for the other uh, speakers, Naomi, uh, Kate, and Moraya. Um, yeah, I, I guess if anyone has any feedback on that, that would be really interesting to hear. Um, and everybody's presentations were amazing, I have to say, and offered a very different way of communicating as well, which I guess is another quite interesting thing with language in that we're used to reading it, you know, from a book or in like a maybe more standard format. And this kind of all these presentations have shown different ways that language can be communicated, like through spoken word. Um, and obviously, Kate holding, you know, you held a book and showed us pages and Mariah with a presentation. So I think it's, yeah, really interesting to see how words have manifested in the different presentations, as well as obviously the texts that have been shared um, and explored. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brooke, for pulling out your comments. Um, and I'm I'm wondering because you started as a creative, uh, you know, studying fine art, and many of the speakers today were, you know, also have this, you know, Mariah is also a photographer as well as a writer, or Kate is like an artist, but also uh, writing is super important. So I'm wondering, like, um, how you balance between, you know, the creative and the writing. Um, aspects yeah I think that that's been like kind of in the work like been developing slowly and I think like any creative practice it takes time to find your voice within that sector or within that sort of area and yeah I'm still kind of figuring it out but I think that in terms of like the background that I've had in a more kind of physical creative manner translating that into text has been quite interesting in just the pure way of kind of 
curating the text or formatting the words on the page, which is why maybe I have a bit more of like a visual way of looking at the page and thinking about it as like a space for um, a medium and the medium being words. Uh, so really considering, yeah, the area in which it's the words are going to populate. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it goes back and forth and, you know, I've worked with a lot of artists now in like my job um, and also with writing and the dialogue that you have is just like, it's, it's honestly unlike anything else um, and getting an insight into the artist's mind and, you know, as a writer wanting to articulate those ideas as best as you can um, to like a wider audience. So, yeah. And I'm wondering, um, going back perhaps to Kate, because you spoke a lot about dreams. I was wondering if your dreams are purely visual or if words come to you in the dreams as well. I don't know if Kate is here. <laughs> oh, 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 she's here, but it's um, Kate, you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I've done it. Sorry, okay. I couldn't find, I couldn't get it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, in my dreams, um, I have words, yes. In fact, words wake me up in the night. Uh, I sometimes woken up by words or phrases that I don't even understand. Then I look them up the next day and then I can write a poem around them or they'll help me understand something I'm doing in my painting. So um, yeah, I'm woken up by words and in my dreams, I, you know, words come in, in conversation. And sometimes I do lucid dreaming where I'm having a dream within a dream or I know that I'm dreaming and I can ask questions that I need to ask. Um, but also images, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always write them down straight away in the next morning or in the night, I work write them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, have you ever like, um, consider, like, have you ever put that, the words as the core of your practice, like, or do you always position the paintings? Um, I, I would like to have the words more central. And I guess it's a question of refinement and confidence and editing. And I'm, I'm working actually funded by Cultivate. I'm working with a poet at the moment and it's helped me enormously to, to, to find the, the words and the phrases that sing and editing. And I found that the process of editing poetry is actually very different to painting. And when I'm, when I'm editing poetry or my writing, I need complete and utter silence. And I go into, a level of focus that is unlike anything I've ever experienced. And in my in my studio when I'm painting, I have music on, I'm dancing, and I'm in a very in a, a very different place that's, that's not still and it's not silent. So the writing de demands something else. But um, yeah, I would like to have the right. I would like. Um, I mean, the poems that I'm writing at the moment, I'd like to have published just as poems with no pictures, which would be interesting. Um, so yeah, thank you. Good question and. Um, yeah, I'm working, <laughs> working on it. And I'm yeah, sure yeah. Naomi has a lot to share about that, considering she has collaborated with so many different types of writers. Yeah, I mean, I just think every it's like every other relationship, isn't it? You negotiate the relationship between you and you you come to something that that meets halfway. And uh, that's when it works. I think that's that's the good thing. And the the unusualness of having a daughter who's a poet and which makes for a very interesting and frank um, way of working because we're equals as we should be, uh, but it is very, it's a very extraordinary way of working with your, you know, with somebody who's my own daughter. But, uh, and it means that when I'm working with writers who I don't know, I'm kind of, I'm ready for anything and they're actually always much easier. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, how have you like found the differences between working with like a poet, with a you know fiction, with a different types of writers, like, and what have you taken from those interactions? It feels uh, it feels like a very generous act because I find writing so difficult myself. The idea that somebody would come and meet you or have a conversation with you in a dialogue, and that something would come out of that which then you can carry around with you forever if you want to, you know, that is part of it that goes into the world. I just find that kind of magic really. And I couldn't do that for anyone else because the writing that I, that, that I struggle to do is so far very personal. I don't know what would happen if I stepped outside myself with writing. I don't know whether I'm capable of doing that. So I really, really admire people who can step outside themselves and, uh, and meet someone like that. 
Mm -hmm. And do you, now when you make artworks, do you feel they're empty if you don't include a, <laughs> a sort of written collaboration? Uh, no, it just seems like a, um, I don't know, it's just, it's part of the mix, isn't it? It's part of the rich mix of working. And when I made a curatorial project with a friend, uh, Ben Sanderson, we made a big project with um, lots of contemporary artists. And we decided in the publication that everybody should write their own piece, a, sh a short piece about, about their piece of work. And it was a really lovely way of presenting everybody's work because it was like an additional voice. Uh, and it was their voice. So maybe this, this becoming slightly braver with writing is manifesting in this way and encouraging other people to as well. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I recently went to see a show at the Goldsmiths um, CCA. It was all about um, presenting monuments. Oh, and yeah. yeah, and I remember seeing the works that were all accompanied by a text uh, under the work, but they were all, you know, completely different to each other. Some were first person, some were third, some were really long, some were really short. And I, I wondered like, it's quite strange not to have a consistency in the language throughout the whole exhibition. You know, usually the text that dis, let's say describe or accompany the artworks in these types of institutions are, you know, what like one paragraph or, you know, quite consistent, but this was like completely different um, one to the other work. And it was because each of the artists had written their own uh, you know, a uh, text um, to be, and they had, you know, positioned it there. And I thought that was really quite interesting as well. Um, but of course, you know, some artists, as you said, are not the best writers. <laughs> well, and, and sometimes we're unreliable narrators of our own experience. You know, we, we can't always be trusted. <laughs> Exactly. Well, <laughs> and I'm wondering, I don't know if Mariah is still here or might be because um, I'm aware he, he might be out. But if you are still here, Mariah, I'm curious to know about your relationship with photography as well and how it might or might not relate to your writing. If you're here, <laughs> um, he might be out. So um, I'm yeah, if anyone wants to also contribute. I know we have a bit less than 10 minutes uh, to continue with this conversation. Um, Vanessa, I yeah. actually have a, have a bit of a question for yeah. you and perhaps your writers as well, because a lot of conversation today is about books and a lot of it, yes, there's we talk about the online form of publishing, but also the physical. Um, how does go being more online do you, do you have any, have you ever thought, okay, actually it would be nice if we ever do a printed version? Uh, do you feel like it makes a difference for the writers, whether it's printed or not? Yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess because um, we work, as you said, online, however, we do feel that we have such a big physical presence within, within what we do, because every single content that is published in our website is based on physical interactions, uh, usually like on site in the actual studio. For the synesthesia, because of the geography exchange, it was, you know, it was based on Zoom conversations. But generally, we're quite local in the sense that every, every kind of, you know, uh, interview or journal has been based on a physical interaction, as well as the analog photography, which documents the studio, which, you know, has this kind of rough texture and very like material. So we, we are online, but in a sense, we feel quite physically present, uh, you know, as a, as a thing in the sense of the, you know, the analog photography having its own weight and texture and material kind of, and also the, you, the physical kind of like, you know, uh, journey of being there and, you know, uh, documenting that. Um, we have thought about um, having its own, you know, uh, thing separately from the online um, multiple times, <laughs> I must say. Um, I mean, what, what we have done since the beginning is uh, when we photograph artist studios, we don't publish all of the images within the website. And since the beginning, we have left some of the images unpublished with the idea that maybe in the future we can do the, a kind of like special thing with, you know, that with the unpublished kind of content. Uh, but I guess, um, I don't know, is the, the quick reply is, um, I guess for us, the way of being physical is to do like physical um, exhibitions and events, you know, 
uh, and not so much with the actual content itself um, at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Al although I must say, um, now that we're doing, we're preparing for the next show, uh, which is opening next week, it's called Shaped um, at the VO Curations here in London. And it's the first time that I've written creative, like more creatively, um, these poems in response to the works of the artists. And it's the first time I I'm going to be also like reading them, uh, like in a, you know, as part of an event. And I felt that was like, I was like thinking, am I a performer now? You know, like reading these texts, it feels like so performative, um, which is like a different step. Like, I feel like the actual writing is quite separate to the reading of it. And what Brooke was just saying, how people were reading, like it, it felt quite different when it was a presentation than when it was a actual physical reading or uh, it has a different weight to it, which yeah. I guess the pu publication is it, it, what it allows when something is printed. I don't know if you all, um, you know, um, feel that way, like Kate, Na Naomi, have you, like when you've actually printed uh, something physically. Because you were mentioning, Kate, that you had printed yeah. your first book recently as well. Yeah. Um, well, the, 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 I had, so I'm, yes, I'm, yeah. I've had two books published. I own a notebooks was my first one. And that was, I think, 2016 or 2017. Um, it does make a difference to have something in your hands. I think it really does. And I, I go, it goes back to um, the other presentation about early language and the, the physical, the physicality of it. And the, and interestingly, the Sumerian writing and, and that, that relates to one of the myths in, in my work about Inanna and Dumuzi. Um, and it's, you know, it's come down through thousands and thousands of years because it was originally, you know, it's been deciphered from the ancient tablets where it's, where, the, where it's been incised on the stone itself. And also early Chinese language, um, the, the pictograms and things all developed that way. Um, so I think it does make a difference. And also that what you said about the performance, when you actually start to read a poem, and I was aware of it when I was reading the writing that I, that, you know, just now, um, that something happens to you and I can't quite articulate what it is, but I will just say one thing I didn't mention is, is, is to do with uh, entering the spirit world. And this is going to sound probably a bit crazy to some of you, but some of you will know that I do do shamanic work and it is about letting something come through you so that when you're reading something out and you're performing it, you, 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 you and also me as an artist, that's what I do. I, I let things come through me. And, and anyone who stands up and reads a poem, whether it's their own or someone else's, it's the life, it's the, the poem that's alive, that has its own life, that you are, you know, you are allowing it to come through you and get, you're bringing it into the world that way. So that's, then it's the sound, you know, and then it's just a different state, a different way of being from the, from stone anyway. We'll be rambling a bit then. I mean, I, I remember going to a panel talk once and uh, I was struck by it because um, the actual panelist who was talking had printed her whole script and was reading it without doing eye contact with the audience, which you would think is very awkward, but she was reading it with such like power. And she every time she read a page, she threw it to the floor uh, with this like strong, like, like just throwing it, smashing it. And so the, by the end of the talk, it was, uh, you know, everyone um, clapped because it felt like such of a performance of like, this whole programmed talk that she had pre-prepared and she was throwing to the floor. And you would think the audience would not connect by, because there was no eye contact at all with the audience. But at the end, it was like quite a powerful talk. Um, and I was really quite surprised by, you know, how these actions of reading out loud and um, change the way you, you know, you respond to the, what's been read. And uh, I guess before we, we say goodbye, um, I just want to introduce that we're after this talk, there will be um, a workshop 
uh, is going to be titled The Paper Stage with Emily Juniper. So of course, everyone is welcome to join um, this workshop. And I just want to thank everyone for your time to Naomi, Kate, Brooke, uh, you know, uh, Mariah, as well as Tonia. Thank you so much for having us today. I encourage everyone to go into the synesthesia.online website to check out the text as well as the datigal.art website and engage more with, you know, with this project.